Well, good morning, my friends. Welcome to Willard Christian Reformed Church. I am so glad you're here. God has called us together, drawn us in this Palm Sunday. This Palm Sunday, that's why we have changed the colors to red, reminds us that we are entering Holy Week and that Jesus' sacrifice, his blood, is what renews and what gives us hope and life. And what a more beautiful thing to do on a day like Palm Sunday than have a baptism. So today, little Gibson will be baptized. A good reminder that God is with us in this covenant. He is here from beginning to end. And so we'll be participating in that sacrament. So I have a few announcements. As we look at, you can look at your bulletin and look at that if you, look, if you like for more information. So Monday, Thursday, uh, Monday, Thursday, excuse me, at 6.30, we'll be offering communion. We certainly encourage you to that service. So that service reflects Jesus' time when he, on that Thursday, thousands of years ago, gave communion to his disciples, then was led to the garden and was betrayed. And so we honor that with a Monday, Thursday service. Look forward to Good Friday and obviously to Easter. So I encourage you to come. Again, that's at 6.30, and we'll be partaking of the sacrament of communion. The other announcement I just want to highlight is again on April 14th at 6 p.m. we will have our class CRC DNA. So if you've wondered what is the Christian Reformed Church, what are we about, and how does that affect how I live, then we certainly invite you to that class. So whether you're a visitor or a member, I invite you to come on April 14th especially when we think about why we worship and it's things like baptism, how that shapes our view of life and even shapes what we do and how we work and how we think. So I invite you to that class. It's also nice to have my mom here uh, for Palm Sunday. It's always lovely to have family in town. I'm sure she likes that I mentioned her, <laughs> embarrassed her. She doesn't. But it's good to have my mom in town. Always an encouragement to have family during the Easter season. So I want to read us a scripture as we enter Palm Sunday, it's the same scripture that the uh, Jews will yell to Jesus. So it's translated a little bit different because remember they take it from the psalm, so it's Hebrew. So they leave out the word Hosanna, but Hosanna simply means save us. So as we enter worship, here's the scripture that were on the Jews' mind as Jesus entered on that donkey. It says this, Lord, save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, from this church, we bless you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Let's bow our heads for a moment of silence before our opening prayer. Holy God and good Father, we praise you because you are good and your love endures forever. So we thank you this morning for coming to us as a peaceful and humble king. We pray that you would help us to learn from you and enter more deeply into your divine life this morning. We pray that we would learn of your love and experience your grace. Lord, as we gather for worship today through the power of your spirit, may we be more aware of your presence. May we learn from your humble entry into Jerusalem, and may you again save us and restore us. Lord, give us your grace this morning and sustain us through your life. All this we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand for our opening song and call to worship. We raise our voices and wave with joyful hope the palms of deliverance of God's people. Lord, save us. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David. Our hearts are filled with expectation, a sense of fulfillment as we welcome the coming King. Lord, save us. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Let us receive in the crowded streets of our lives the one who is Savior, not only of us, but all of earth. Lord, save us. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest heaven. Please join us in singing Hosanna, loud Hosanna. So every Sunday we're reminded that we're invited into the story of God, and God's greeting does that. But especially during things like Palm Sunday and Holy Week, we are invited into and remember how these events are part of our story. So we celebrate things like the coming of our King, because not only was he coming for Jerusalem, he was coming to save us. Our story is wrapped up in God's story. So my friends, receive this greeting from God, from Zechariah 9. It says this, Rejoice greatly, people of God. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. Amen. So in the same way that we've been greeted, let's greet one another this morning. Hey, my friend. Good to see you. Yeah, sure. Where are you originally from?
You may be seated. That song is certainly a beautiful reminder of the things that we've lost, even the sins we've committed. All those things are restored and returned to us and forgiven in Christ Jesus. And so that's why confession is so important to me and and to the church, that we do it every week and we remind ourselves that we are part of this story, part of this great cosmic saving, not just of your personal sin or even your collective sin or, or your suffering, but even the collective and cosmic universal renewal of Christ Jesus. And we wait, that song's so beautiful, change from glory into glory. We continually wait for Christ to renew us. And so confession is just a time where we meet with that humble king, that one who rode in on that lowly donkey, but who will come again. Revelation tells us he will ride on a great white horse again, coming to restore creation perfectly. It's a beautiful vision, and confession and assurance of pardon capture that vision. So at this church, what we do is we confess privately to ourselves, and we confess our sins to God, and then we confess corporately to God. So I invite you now to confess privately to your loving God. Let's pray. So we confess with the whole church, saying, Create in us a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, and uphold us with a willing spirit. Amen. So my friends, the scripture tells us in Philippians 2, an interesting passage, Paul says, in your relationships with one another, other Christians have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. By becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So my friends, because of Christ's humble obedience, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven because God's love never fails. Thanks be to God. So let's stand, lifting our hearts, singing, O God, beyond all praising.
is time for the children's message. Time for the children. If the children would like to come up to this pew right here, we'll have the children's message. Yeah, you can come up here. Come on, Ricky. Good job. Hey, that's it. Hey, hey. I like your shoes. I like your shoes. Hi, Corbin. Hi, Kennedy. Hello. Hi, friends. Good morning. Good morning. We have some friends with us today, some new friends here to see Gibson get baptized. Do you know what today is called? Do you know what Sunday is called, Kennedy? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. You're exactly right. Palm Sunday. Do you know why we have these palms? Great answer, yeah, because the people of Jerusalem laid them down, and we also use these to get rid of snow. That's part of our, no, that's not true. Uh, So I'm going to give you each a palm, each a palm. So you're right, that's exactly right. So in in Jesus' day, if you wanted to honor someone, that's okay, I got another one, there we go. If you wanted to honor someone, the way you would do it is you would wave these palms. Can we all wave these palms? frantically so you'd wave these palms and then as the person came whoever you wanted to honor you would lay them down on the ground can we make a little path with the palms so you'd make a little path and then that person and for the adults that can't see we've got a beautiful green path here on our carpet here and the person would walk across these palms now in the olden days it meant one simple thing and this is good for y'all to remember and for every adult to remember this symbolized that that person was a king that they were the most powerful person, and they wanted to recognize him as king. So on Palm Sunday, y'all can pick up your palms back up. On Palm Sunday, we remember that Jesus is king. And that means that he's Lord over our lives, and we can come to him with anything because he treats us like his children. But he's also our king. And so we remember that too on Palm Sunday. So you'll see that throughout the service, you might see palms all over. And you can keep these palms. The second thing I want to tell you is there's going to be a baptism at the end of the service. And so y'all are going to come back in at the end of the service and be a part of seeing Gibson be baptized. So you can come sit back here, you can sit with your family. But when we have a baptism, you will come back in and get to see that and participate. So what we'll do now is we'll pray to our king and then you'll be dismissed to Sunday school. Okay, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and your kindness. We thank you that you have come as king. You have come to save us. Lord, be with each child here. Keep them in your love and your grace. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And we all said, amen. 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 Okay, you can be dismissed. And you can go right out there for Sunday school, okay? Please pray with me in our congregational prayer. God of our lives, six weeks ago we gathered in this place to begin our Lenten journey. We reflected on our mortality, we confessed our sins, and we experienced forgiveness through Christ. Since that day of ashes, we have journeyed day by day toward Jerusalem, to the procession of palms and hosannas of today, into the temple and streets, and soon into the Garden of Gethsemane and what lies beyond. It has not always been an easy journey. We have been stretched and challenged to expose our sorrow with expressions of lament and pain. Pain suffered from the unexpected death of a father or in battling cancer, kidney failure, or any lingering illness. The feelings of burden and stress while caring for loved ones who are declining in physical strength or mental clarity. 
sadness from the ravages of war and oppression creating death, displacement, hunger, and despair. Frustration and worry when things just simply break down or don't seem to go our way. We are grateful, God, that we have not been alone. We are grateful that you have been with us all the while, supporting and comforting us. We have hope because of your great love. We are not consumed, for your compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, O God. We are also grateful that we have had each other as traveling companions. You have created us to be in community with each other, and in times of need, we understand why. Thank you for this sacred community, cast in your image, shaped by your love. Help us as we follow Jesus together to broaden our concept of community, to include not only those we know and love, but also strangers both near and far, and yes, even those who find us annoying and infuriating. Capture our hearts and minds with a vision of your kingdom and inspire us to work tirelessly to bring it to be in this world. You have shown us, God, what is right and just. You have shown us what it means to love as you love. In Christ, you have shown us what it means to give everything to this call, to live lives of radical obedience, radical humility, and radical love. Through the power of your spirit, may we surrender to your ways using meekness and compassion in the serving of others. <clears throat> Lord, may we live our lives with such determination and focus that we might find the courage to lay aside the pleasures, comforts, and needs of our own lives in order to give life to others. Indeed, abundant life for all. We bring before your throne the needs of the Hope Center. Use our offering this morning to accomplish your good work. Bless our own who commit time and talents working with disaster relief services to care for those in need. May their work be fruitful, may their time together be filled with joy, and may they return safely home. God, you call us to be a part of your kingdom. You call us to lead others to it. So hear us now as we pray for the coming of that kingdom in the words Jesus taught us long ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We now have the privilege of returning a portion of our blessings back to God. The first offering today is for the general fund, and the second offering is for the Hope Center. Will the deacons come forward at this time for a time of giving?
Old Testament reading this morning comes from the book of Zechariah. Please bow your heads with me for a holy week prayer of illumination. Eternal God, whose word silences the shouts of the mighty, quiet within us every voice but your own. Speak to us through the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we may receive grace to show Christ's love in lives given to your service. Amen. Zechariah 9, verses 9 through 17. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you riding and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. I will bend Judah as I bend my bow and fill it with Ephraim. I will rouse your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, and make you like warrior's sword. Then the Lord will appear over them. His arrow will flash like lightning. The sovereign Lord will sound the trumpet. He will march in the storms of the south, and the Lord Almighty will shield them. They will destroy and overcome with sling stones. They will drink and roar as with wine. They will be full like a bowl used for sprinkling the corners of the altar. The Lord their God will save them on that day as the flock of his people. They will sparkle in his land like jewels in a crown. How attractive and beautiful they will be. Grain will make the young men thrive and new wine the young women. This is the reading of God's word. So the next few weeks, we'll be going through Holy Week, and then obviously Easter, and after Easter as well, we'll do another sermon on kind of what happened to Jesus during this time. You'll notice that Zechariah, the Old Testament reading that we just read, is kind of a snapshot. It's a glimpse of what this riding into Jerusalem means, and you also probably, some of you would have picked up on some of those phrases that get carried over to the New Testament, some of this renewal idea, God coming back, restoring. You see this kind of picked up again in the New Testament. So my text today is Matthew 21. Matthew 21, we could have gone to any gospel. All four gospels contain the triumphant entry, so it's pretty important. But we'll go to Matthew 21, uh, 1 through 11. But I'm going to read just the first two verses to begin. This is the story, kind of Matthew setting the scene. As they, that's the Jesus and the disciples and a large crowd, approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. Let's pray. Father, we praise you that through Jesus Christ you are our king and that you will make all things new. So we ask again that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so again, illuminate your word to us this morning that we might more clearly see your son. And all this we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit and in Jesus' name, amen. So the title of the message today is The humble, the King's Humble Entry, and we'll look a little bit at why it's such a humble entry, but yet the key word there being king. If I was to start a story with you and I was to say something like, it was the bottom of the ninth inning, it was tie score, bases loaded, and Babe Ruth is up to bat. Those phrases, while well, you might not be a huge baseball fan, those phrases might mean something to you, right? You would have some clues as to what game is being played, 
what's happening and even what's at stake. And maybe the more you know about baseball, maybe the more you could connect with that story, really get what's happening. But if I started another story with it's the 79th minute and the dummy half gets up behind the play the ball, dummies and offloads to Darren Locke here, who lines up for the drop goal, you might begin to think that I'm speaking a different language. I have no idea what Caleb just said. This is actually a game I watched when I was in, in Australia the, the, of the National Rugby League. And so if you were to know something about that sentence, if that sentence was to have any sort of meaning to you, you'd have to know a little bit about rugby, and maybe some of you did, and you caught some of those phrases. But you'd have to know about the particular terms and details of the National Rugby League of Australia to really get the significance of this story. And that what I mean by what I'm saying is that the best rugby league player in Australia, Darren Lockyer, was about to win the game. It all of a sudden would make more significance. You would make more meaning of what's really happening in this story. And as I studied Matthew 21 and studied it before, as we think about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, I begin to realize there are details that I was missing. And that Matthew gives us these clues that the audience would have just got. And they knew Matthew, you'll see these clues, they knew Matthew was telling a story of cosmic significance. Some guy wasn't just getting on a donkey going into town, but that Jesus was doing something much bigger. That's why we said it's found in all four Gospels. And so as we look at this text, we don't want to miss the big thing that's happening just because we don't pick up on some of those details. And so why does Jesus come in on a donkey? Well, because of what it means for the Jews, for us, and for the entire world. And so Matthew 21, you, you could see, kind of breaks down, and there's Jesus preparing for this prophecy. We'll see it kind of played out, and then him fulfilling the prophecy, and then this anticipation of the prophet. And so I want to read Matthew verse one, uh, 21, 1 through 5 again, and you'll see a very common formula where he says, this will be fulfilled like. So just pick up on that. That's been throughout the whole book. We'll pick up again at verse 1, and we'll read the whole thing kind of in context. So verse 1 through 5 says this. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage in the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. At once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Here's the narrator speaking. Say to the daughter of Zion, see, your king comes to you. The passage we just read. Gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The first clue we get is Matthew includes, on purpose, this idea, you'll notice in the first verse, the Mount of Olives. Most commentators realize and see that the Jews believed that the Mount of Olives was connected to the coming of the Messiah. So he gives us our first clue. And if we were a first century reader, we would have caught on, I see what you're doing, Matthew. He's saying basically to us, here comes the Messiah. And in this passage, the interesting thing, Jesus has often been kind of uh, uh, staying away from this idea that he's the Messiah, or at least not always explicitly stating he is the Messiah. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't. But here we see he embraces his Messiahship or his kingship, but he embraces his being a Messiah, that is the idea of king, on his terms. So he sends two disciples, right? He sends them to kind of take a donkey. It's an interesting idea there. And John Calvin actually believes that Jesus does this so no one could say he's being called a king against his wishes. What we need to pick up on is Jesus is planning. He's orchestrating this event. In the first century, it would have been very normal, a king, anyone who's trying to establish authority, what they would have done is they would have taken a war horse and they would have come into the city on this war horse. That's what most people did in the first century to kind of establish who they are. But a donkey, interestingly enough, symbolizes peace in the first century. And so Jesus is telling them this. He's saying, I am coming to you in peace. And most importantly, Jesus chooses a donkey. He orchestrates this event so that he can enact, or you could say fulfill, Zechariah 9. 
So the passage we just said, Jesus is actually saying, I am this king of Zechariah 9.9. And he's telling everyone who sees him that day that he's coming humbly, but he's this humble a king. Throughout Holy Week, Jesus will do this. Jesus will talk about his authority and his messiahship, and yet he will come across very lowly, sometimes even submissive, sometimes humiliated. But he's showing both his power and his humility, his lowliness and his messianic kingdom. John Calvin would actually write on this, that Jesus intended to show by a solemn performance what was the nature of his kingdom. Now, for some of you who are real cluey, you might have noticed in verse 9, you might have seen that actually Matthew eliminates one of the phrases out of verse 9. He eliminates righteous or victorious and salvation. There's a phrase in there that he leaves out, and he emphasizes Jesus' coming. He does this because while Matthew believes Jesus will be victorious, he wants to emphasize the humility and lowliness of this messianic king. That's his message, that Jesus is coming in sort of a humble way. And so this kingship that Jesus portrays, it kind of undermines the authorities like the Romans and the Jews because his kingdom, he's saying, is one that comes from God. It's one that comes in peace And it brings peace for all people. So Jesus orchestrated this entry into Jerusalem. And he wants us to tell us, and I believe he wants to tell us today, something about himself. And he tells us first off by this entry that he is the Messiah. He is the king. And he is lowly and humble in heart. That he comes in power and in peace. Many theologians and and pastors have talked about this idea that Jesus comes and accommodates to us. He accommodates to our weakness. He is approachable. He calls us his king, and yet he treats us like children. And so that means when Hebrews tells us that you can come to him and find grace and peace in your time of need, that is exactly what we can do. And this coming to Jesus for us today cannot be separated from our prayers. And prayers is this communion with Jesus, the idea of talking to him, learning from Jesus. In fact, Matthew tells us before, one of my favorite verses, and maybe one of yours, Matthew tells us if we yoke ourselves to Jesus, we will learn from him and his humble heart. So prayer is this awareness, even now, that Christ is your king. Not just 2,000 years ago going into Jerusalem, but he is available to you right now. That Jesus is approachable, that he's with you in your sufferings. And in our prayers, we actually learn from him and experience this peace. So Matthew tells us something about Jesus, and he tells us that Jesus prepares for this prophecy. And then we see the fulfillment of the prophecy. So we'll go to verse 6. Go to verse 6 and we'll see this fulfillment of the prophecy. It says this. The disciples went and did just as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now Jesus entered. So this happens in preparation for Passover. Passover is a really tense time for the authorities because Passover for the Jews celebrates the time that they were released from foreign oppressors. Right? So it's already for the Romans kind of feel a little uneasy, and this is the time. Not only that, but the city swells in size. Historians kind of tend to exaggerate, but it certainly gets bigger because all Jews, especially males, are meant to go back to Jerusalem during Passover. This, this city is just full of people. And these people then are doing these gestures in front of the Rome, in front of everybody, that are cultural cues that the people are acknowledging Jesus as their king. So they put their cloaks down in a way to pay homage. So you could see examples like in 2 Kings where it says that they put their cloaks down and they bear the steps so they blew the trumpet that Yahuwah is king. 
And they made haste and took their garments and put them under the bare steps. So you see this idea that the Jews are taking from. So the people also call him son of David, which is a messianic title. Son of David was the king. They're saying the son of the king. And then they're saying things like Hosanna, which literally means God save us or save please. Now these prayers, they're really acclamations. And if you really look at them, you could see them as someone would be like saying, God save the king or all hail the king. So it's clear from what the people are shouting that they are seeing God as this, they're seeing Jesus as this messianic king. And the last phrase that the people say, and we often say, we sing before, it says, Hosanna, or God save in the highest. And that's a prayer for God to save in the best way possible, as one man said. It also carries the idea that he would save the entire world. So these people are beginning to yell, basically, all hail the king, while during Passover, there's this massive tension and worry about a king usurping their authority. So you could feel sort of the tenseness here, but they're asking for a personal, political, and even cosmic saving. And so the people are calling for Jesus to save, and Jesus will save. In fact, as we go through Holy Week, we'll see that he saves in a vastly different way than the Jews expected. The same people that cry out, Hosanna, save us, will also cry out, crucify him. And he will save in a completely different or humble way. In fact, we'll see him humiliated by the cross. And so because of this, it's good for us too to cry out, save us. I don't know what sort of sin or suffering you may experience, but again, it's an encouragement to call out to Christ to save us, to, to hear our prayer and know that he will answer us. Because the scriptures tell us that we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. And so approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that you might receive mercy and find grace to help you in time of need. So Jesus will save in a completely different way than the Jews expected, maybe completely different for us. But he saves us and listens to our prayers. And so G Matthew has shown that Jesus kind of plans this, right? And he, he fulfilled, then he fulfills this prophecy. And finally, we see the last two verses, kind of this anticipation of the prophet. So if you pick up with me in verse 10, this is kind of the end of his triumphal entry, at least in Matthew's account. It's just two verses. He says this. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. That's a pretty intense Greek word. And, he asked who, and they asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This stirred word is often used for earthquake or kind of apocalyptic upheavals. It's a really big deal. It's a shaking in fear, if you will. It stirs the whole city. And in fact, if you look at Matthew, he'll have two more stirring earthquakes. Apocalyptic events happen. When Jesus dies, the earth quakes. It's stirred. And then when Jesus rises again from the grave, you find this third sort of uh, uh, quake in the ground. Now, in these verses, it's not to be confusing. As I looked at it first, I kind of was a little put off by it. But it's not that the people didn't know who Jesus was. They knew who Jesus was. But they're asking who he is in the sense of like, well, what is he, right? Well, they know that he's Jesus, he's this person, but, but what is he to do? And in the people's answer, many people see that the way they phrase the prophet, it's connected to Deuteronomy 818. 8, and that says this, I will raise up for them, God says to his people in Deuteronomy 8, I will raise up for them a prophet, like from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So Matthew's drawing in this text so that people see that maybe this is this prophet king, this Messiah, that they're waiting for. And we find that Jesus will answer their call to save them now. He will save them now. But just like this humble entry, he will save them in a surprisingly humble way. And so we'll find out next week that for the Jews, for us, for the world, 
that actually our salvation comes through Jesus' humiliation. So it's, a, it's an interesting passage. There's a lot of cues or clues in it that we can see that the Jews were recognizing Jesus as this Messiah King. One thing I want to point out is that Jesus orchestrated, right? He planned, whether prophetically, however you want to look at it, but Jesus planned this event. He planned to embrace this idea that he is the Messiah's king, he is the Messiah king, and he's sent by God to bring a new kingdom. And so our king's humble entry into Jerusalem was and is a threat to the powers that be. So any power that tries to usurp God, this humble entry undermines every other human authority that tries to usurp God. Because what you see beautifully is that Christ comes in peace, humbly, to save us and not serve himself. And then somehow, powerfully and mysterious, as we look forward, he will fulfill what the prophet said about Jesus. He will save now. Even when the prophet would say he will be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, but by his wounds we will be healed. And so we see in the Holy Week that Jesus despised the shame but embraced his suffering. And that he humbly entered our pain, and he still does, our sin and our suffering in order to save us now. And then one day we will see Jesus again. This triumphant entry also connects us to Revelation. Not only does it connect us to the beginning of the Bible, but it also points to the end. Where Jesus does come again mounted on a steed, but this time on a horse. And this time he does finally and powerfully come to eradicate all evil, sin, suffering, and the final enemy, death. And I just want to say this is what the Jews were imagining. This is when we read this passage. They weren't just hoping that Jesus would overthrow the Romans. They certainly wanted that. They were imagining a cosmic renewal and restoration, even of their bodies, even of their lost loved ones. And we see it points us to Revelation, where Revelation gives us a fuller vision and tells us that there will be a white horse, John writes, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. We see a different Jesus now. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses. And on his robe, Jesus' robe, and on his thigh, a place powerfully put where people could see, his name was written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And John tells us he will bring a new heaven and new earth, and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And so this is this cosmic vision of our king's salvation, and it's first glimpsed, and it's continually glimpsed year after year by a man who rode in on a donkey 2,000 years ago. And in this meandering ride into Jerusalem, this was the beginning of our vision of renewal and renewal of the whole world. And so the triumphant entry is this beginning of this cosmic saving, this saving for you and me. That a man would come in peace to us and save us. And so he is still, his story is wrapped up in our story as Christians. He is still the king that we say, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. God save us in the highest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are our king, full of love and justice. Father, help this vision of your judgment and your renewal of the world capture our imaginations and our hearts. May this vision determine our allegiance to you. Lord, we thank you that you've come humbly to save us and to help us. Lord, save me, save each of us here and our world. Save us from evil, suffering, death, and sin. And all this we pray in the name of the Father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
please stand and join us for our song of response, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. So we have an exciting thing we get to do today, which is participate in baptism, in the sacrament of baptism. So I'd ask Darren if you could grab the children uh, so that they could come in and join us. And I'd also ask Eric and Alexis and Gibson to join me here on the, on the stage by the baptismal. And this is a wonderful way, as they're coming up, it's a wonderful way to think about the start of Holy Week. What a great start to think about God's promises towards us, that God will save us, right? And this is what the covenant looks to. So in the baptism of this child, he is coming into our covenant community. So we're going to talk about how we as a church covenant with the parents, the parents covenant with us in order that we promise salvation, and so I think it's a great picture of God's sheer grace and love for us. Little Gibson's getting his, his shoes ready. We're not baptizing him by immersion, don't worry. We're just, we're just preparing him. And you guys can come right up here. So baptism for us is a very important time of welcoming them into the covenant, welcoming Gibson into the covenant community. It's the sign and seal, as we reform folk often like to say, but it's a promise. It's a mutual promise of all of us. So I want you to hear the words, the institution of the sacrament. Hear this from Scripture in Galatians 3, 26 through 29. It says this, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to his promise. What was the promise given to Abraham but that he would circumcise his children as they entered the covenant? What is the promise given to us, but now circumcision has become baptism. And in this covenant community, when, so, when a child is born to 
Christian parents or parent, and they bring their child, it is like circumcision. They are entering little Gibson today, hey buddy, <laughs> into the covenant. He is looking right at me. Most of the time they're asleep, he is awake, so we will see. He's doing great. You're doing great, buddy. And so I want to ask the parents a few questions. I want to ask y'all a question, and if you're able, you'll respond. And we're again, we're, we're working this promise together. So our whole service is called the covenant renewal. I don't baptize someone based on the faith that they show. I baptize because what God has done for us in the covenant. God moved toward us in grace. So as we go through this, I, again, I'll ask you some questions and, and y'all will respond. So baptism, parents, is the celebration that God is gracious to you, your child, and your whole church. And it's a sign for us that celebrates God's promise and love to his people. You are covenanting with us and we with you. So Gibson, little guy, you are becoming part of our family today. Baptism is also a covenant, a seal that, we will raise, that they will raise the child in the nurture of God, hoping for his profession of faith when he is older. So it's a promise from the parents, but it's also a promise from us. So it's also a serious thing for us to witness and say that we will participate in the spiritual edification and growth as best we can, not usurping the parents, but coming alongside the parents in order to raise this child. Eric and Alexis have also selected godparents. So I'd like both Emma Mall and Ben Wilcox to stand up, respectively, the godmother and godfather. In the Reformed tradition, there is not really, it's up to the parents on if they desire godparents or not. In the Reformed tradition, they don't have much to say about godparents per se, but they say that they have a specific role in the spiritual growth of the children. It does not, again, eliminate the parents' responsibility or the church's responsibility, only that they will be specifically involved in certain aspects of Gibson's life. You can be seated. And for all of us in the church, we are promising that we are going to be with these parents. We are going to help you nurture your children. And so I want to ask the parents first. I want to ask the parents first. And they'll respond with, we do, if they feel so willing. But in knowing that this is a covenant with each other, that we're going to want to partner with you in raising God's people by God's grace, having heard all God's gracious promises to us in Christ, do you desire that Gibson be baptized? We do. Amen. Amen. Will you devote yourselves to the church's fellowship and teaching to the breaking in bread and the prayers. Amen. Amen. They said we do both times. They don't have a mic, but that, they said it. So congregation, now we covenant with them. And so if you're able, you will see that there will be a question and a response. And we are promising to nurture this child in the Lord, covenanting with them. So if you're able, please respond to the next question with, we will with God's help. So, do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting these parents in the Christian nurturing of this child? We do, with God's help. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we are able to baptize Gibson today. Pray that you would be with us and give us your grace in this time. Amen. So my friends, as I pour the baptismal... He's preparing. I want to read this scripture. And as we see the water poured out, we're reminded of what it says. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father for all, who is over all and through all and in all. And so little Gibson you'll bring him a little closer. So little Gibson, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. May you be kept in his love all your days. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the faith and the covenanting community of both Eric and Alexis and our church. Lord, we thank you for little Gibson. 
Lord, as we hear him today, we pray that you would keep him in your love and your grace. We are grateful for him. We are grateful for his entrance into the community. Lord, give us the spirit as we covenant with these parents to raise him in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we ask all these things in your name. Amen. I'm sorry, Justin. (laughs) You guys can be seated. You may be seated. Poor guy, I really got him, and he was awake, so he knew he could see it all coming, but he did a great job, he did a great job. So would you please stand, we're going to close with our doxology and benediction, welcoming little Gibson into our community of faith. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. So my friends, what a beautiful thing to baptize a child into the faith, to remember that God saves us and is in the process of saving each and every one of us. So receive this sending today, that the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you, and the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The Lord is king forever. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.